Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my real pleasure to welcome you to a new global immunotalk. I'm here today with my uh, dear friend and organizer of the global immunotalks, uh, Dr. Susan Kaek, who will be introducing our speaker today, uh, Dr. Francisco Quintana, who I happen to know from decades ago when we were both in Argentina, and I think uh, Sue will tell us more about it. So Sue, take it away. Thank you, and thank you so much, Fran, for joining us, and Carla, again, for all the uh, leadership that you've provided to the immunology community through Global Immunotox. It's just been fantastic to have this opportunity, and we are really excited for our, our speaker today. Um, I also want to say hello to everyone uh, uh, out there. Um, hola, bonjour, guten tag, uh, hola, I can't, this is probably got a better accent, salve, uh, konnichiwa, so I just want to say hello to everybody who's who's joining us. And I'm sorry if I can't pronounce everybody's <laughs> hellos, but it's great to have you. So so Francisco, or we can call you Fran, correct? Um, is I was uh, had a treat in meeting him for the first time in Sao Paulo at a at a at a conference that we were at, and he was like the prince of the meeting. He was just so beloved and and had such a uh, influence on so many people um, uh, uh, in, in the, at, that was at the conference. He had a lot of important connections. And I remember his talk because it was one of the, the most exciting talks I had heard in a while, honestly. It was just so, so exciting. I hadn't thought so much about how um, the, the CNS is controlled and that was what you were talking about at that time and, and immune tolerance. And so, so Fran has um, had a very productive career. Uh, he, he started, um, his PhD at, at the Weizmann Institute with Arun Cohen, uh, working on, on T cells and moved to, to Harvard uh, with Howard Weiner. Um, and there had a very, very illustrious um, uh, launch on his, his career and then to independence at Harvard where he um, uh, became a professor in the neurology department. And then um, uh, more recently, the professor of neuro is a professor of neurology uh, a few years ago and is also the president of the International Society uh, of Neuroimmunology. Um, he's also been the recipient of, of many awards, um, including um, awards from uh, Crohn's and Colitis, uh, the Harvey Weaver Research Scholar Award. Uh, he's received Young Mentor Awards at Harvard. Uh, he's an honorary professor at the University of Freiburg, um, has had received the Brunswick Prize for Innovation in MS Research and the Kutru and Weiner Distinguished Professor of Neurology. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. When Fran um, has one of his biggest contributions into the field has been the um, regulation of, of T cells and, and our, our central nervous system microglia and astrocytes through um, the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. And so I wanted to see if you could just give us a couple of quick minutes to, or a second talk, sentences to tell us about how you came to that um, discovery. So um, it all started when I was still a graduate student at the Weizmann. And then um, there was a, a talk about using uh, flies in order to identify um, um, pathways that regulate the immune system, the innate immune system. So at the time I was literally starting to think what I would like to do or what I would love to do as a, as a postdoc and potentially in my own lab. And then I thought, well, silverfish would be very cool, right? Because they are vertebrates. I was always very interested in reading things outside my topics and, you know, I have read that they have T cells, you know, I never had fish as pets. I have to be very straightforward about that. But, um, uh, and, and I thought, well, that would be great to study T reg, you know, regulation of T cells. I was coming from a very strong T cell lab. Um, so I got here, convinced my mentor at the time, Howard Weiner to do it. And then first thing I did was to clone FOXP3 in zebrafish. And then the real question was, was, so what, right? So then what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. And the idea was basically to identify, okay, what is regulating it? And if it is conserved through evolution, probably is relatively important. And that led us to several transcription factors, uh, but AHI was the only one that was controlled by small molecules. So I thought it would give me a very uh, straightforward uh, tool you know, using chemicals as a way of really understanding the pathway until I would generate knockouts and so on and so forth. So that literally led us to AHR and then one thing took us to another. First it was T cells, then it was dendritic cells, then it was astrocytes, then it was microglia, then it was monocytes, then it was autoimmunity, then it was what, viral infections, uh, <laughs> and then it's keep growing. But uh, that's actually how we ended up there. And then it's also cancer. 
So yeah, yeah, that is a great connection. I yeah, the uh, the regulation of the microbiota that you've discovered through through AHR and other molecules and how that controls the the tolerance of of the of the brain. I think it's just uh, such a fascinating area. And so um, with that, I'll give you our our question that we usually ask our speakers um, and. We've all been influenced. We couldn't have gotten here without other people uh, who have helped us along the way. What was some of the most, um, in your thinking about the what, how, what you've learned from other people, what was some of the most influential advice or um, comments that you've ever received that helped you and who, and who gave so, them to you? So through the years, I, I've received and I keep receiving, uh, it sounds almost funny, but I keep receiving advice from my graduate mentor and my postdoctoral mentor from Howard Weiner and Jerome Cohen. I still consult them when I have something I'm really worried about. And when I was finishing my graduate studies, right, I was literally driving myself crazy trying to understand what parameter follow in order to choose the best laboratory ever for a postdoctoral stage, right? And We've all been there and you start to think, oh, should I go for publications? Some were established, some were big, some were small, which city? And I was honestly having these long lists that were leading me nowhere. And then like your own coin just sat me and said, look, the only thing you really have to care about is to know yourself and know literally what's the environment when you flourish and you feel most comfortable. And it sounds silly, it sounds something very basic, right? But for me, that was very important. And, and, and in collaborations, in everything I do, I would say that's one of the driving principles. If I just feel comfortable in exchanging ideas, working with someone, those collaborations, those interactions tend to grow. And I have many of those that have several decades, which is a good thing. So yeah. it's a simple advice, but I have to say it brought me a lot of peace of mind. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, thank you. We're super excited for your talk. So we'll let you, let you begin. Super, thank you so much. Uh, uh, oh, and I wanted my... to, oh, I'm sorry, I have to remind the audience, so I'm new at this, so um, uh, uh, Fran will have, a, has a Twitter account, um, which uh, we will see at the end of the talk, and we will ask you to solicit your questions to Fran at, uh, through Twitter, so, and he, he will respond during the day, so thank you all for your, 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 your participation. Super, thank you again. Thanks a lot for having me here. It's, it's such an honor, such a pleasure. I mean, being here with many of friends. And, one, and I will also list my Twitter account uh, at the end of the presentation. Do you get to see my screen, full screen? Yep. Yes, you're ready to go. Super. So what I want to do today is to talk uh, about CNS inflammation, you know, like Susan really introduce it in a very nice way. Um, we're very interested on in that from multiple aspects. And again, thanks a lot for the nice introduction. Um, but today what I wanna do is actually to focus not so much from the point of view of the T cells, right? How they are generated, how they're regulated, how they make it to the CNS, but actually what happens with those tissue resident cells? How do they react to inflammation? How do they control inflammation? And how could we potentially target them therapeutically? And in particular, I'm going to focus on the role of astrocytes. Um, the model of the disease we're most focused about is multiple sclerosis. Probably many of you are familiar with it. And basically that's an autoimmune disease or is initiated as an autoimmune disease where uh, the immune system uh, destroys this myelin that you can see here. And that eventually leads to uh, actional dysfunction, actional loss and neuronal loss. The, challenge or, or the reason why we believe this is important is because although initially, right, we do know that multiple sclerosis starts like a classic autoimmune disease. And this is an example of that. You have T cells activated or induced in the periphery, reactivated in the CNS, causing DNS, causing axonal and myelin damage. All of that we know, and all of that has important clinical implications indeed. We have many therapies that are now in the clinic that can actually address, you know, target multiple steps of these T cell driven inflammatory response or inflammatory attack to the CNS. And that has to do with interfering uh, with the activation of T cells, for example, by B cells, interfering with the ability of T cells to make, into the C to make it into the CNS or potentially interfering 
with the polarization of those T cells into pathogenic T cells. However, all of this is nice, but the challenge we still address is the fact that um, when these T cells make it to the CNS, they're also not only, they're, they're not only going to cause tissue destruction, they're also going to act on CNS resident cells to trigger a different type of inflammation, inflammation driven mostly by microglia and astrocytes. This inflammation can itself lead uh, to pathology and it does so through multiple mechanisms. But the challenge we have is that we really don't know uh, much about the mechanisms that regulate inflammatory responses driven by microglia and astrocytes. And that obviously results in our lack of uh, efficacious therapies to control the deregulated activity of microglia and astrocytes. And something which is important uh, and, and why I think these studies are very relevant is the fact that although we're getting to the deregulated activity of astrocytes and microglia from the point of view of multiple sclerosis and its experimental model uh, EIE, the deregulated activity of these cells also contributes to the pathology of other uh, neurodegenerative diseases. You can think Alzheimer's, you can think Parkinson's, you can think ALS. So understanding how these cells are regulated or how we could potentially uh, target these regulatory mechanisms therapeutically is very important. So my lab in particular has focused on understanding the role of astrocytes in, 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 in this CNS inflammation. And the, the reason astrocytes, you know, they get this name is because they're shaped, they're star, uh, they have this shape that looks like stars. And indeed, this is a cell type that for years were no, was known to play very important roles in the context of jazz homeostasis and development. They are important for the development and maintenance of the blood-brain barrier, which as you know, uh, dictates what molecules or cells can literally get into the CNS. Its astrocytes are important for the development of neurons, for the development and functioning of, of uh, uh, synapses. And one of the things that astrocytes do is also provide uh, metabolic support for neurons. Hence, neurons are going to rely strongly on metabolites such as lactate produced by astrocytes. Many of these homeostatic functions of astrocytes are actually impaired in the context of pathology, are impaired in the context of inflammation. On top of that, astrocytes gain disease-promoting pathogenic activities in the context of inflammation. And those activities are associated, for example, with the production of chemokines that recruit monocytes into the CNS. CCL2 is a clear example. These activities are also associated with the activation of CNS resident cells, such as uh, microglia. And on top of that, astrocytes are known to have themselves endogenous uh, cell autonomous neurotoxic activity. All of these activities obviously can contribute to the pathology of neurologic diseases. Now we have then these activities that are impaired in the context of inflammation, and then there's new, these new activities that are gained in the context of inflammation of CN or CNS pathology. The problem is when we start to wonder, we try to understand whether all of these is done by one single cell or by multiple cell subsets. And indeed, Santiago Ramon Cajal more than a hundred years ago, as you know, he got uh, the Nobel Prize because of the insights he provided uh, in terms of the uh, functioning of the immune, of the central nervous system. Well, when Ramon y Cajal was analyzing astrocytes, it was clear to him that there were several subsets of astrocytes, at least based in their morpholo morphology, right? So one of the questions we're going to try to understand or dis discuss with you today is, how different subsets of astrocytes are associated with different functions. A second question we'll try to discuss today is how these different subsets and functions are actually regulated by cell-cell interactions, because that was the second, what I would say, important information observation made by Ramon y Cajal. Astrocytes are highly interconnected with other astrocytes, and also with other cells in the central nervous system.
So in order to address that, in order to try to understand or reassess the question of how diverse astrocytes are and how uh, are they regulated by different cell cell interactions, we established a program by which we analyzed uh, tissue from multiple sclerosis patients and also tissue isolated uh, from preclinical models of multiple sclerosis. As I mentioned, this is mostly the EIE model. And we analyzed the samples by back and single cell approaches that focus on trying to understand the transcriptomic, epigenetic, and metabolic regulation of astrocytes. So what I'm going to do today is to share with you two examples that I think highlight the extremes of the different functions that astrocytes can play in the context of cell, of CNS inflammation. And while doing so, what I will try to do is first of all, identify subsets and identify markers for these different subsets, then identify the molecular mechanisms that regulate those subsets. And then once we have identified those molecular mechanisms performed in vivo uh, cell specific gene perturbation studies as a way of trying to understand uh, what specific function each one of these subsets plays in uh, um, health and disease. So with that in mind, I wanna share with you uh, the first piece of our data, but before I would do that, I wanna just take a second to think or to put in context what I do, what do I mean when I talk about astrocyte subsets? And the problem is very simple, right? Our studies analyze uh, let's say transcriptional profiles or epigenetic profiles of astrocytes at a very specific point. It's, some, it's a type of cross-sectional study. And the, the implication of that is that what I call astrocyte subsets might represent both subsets or subpopulations of astrocytes that are established during development because they are located in different areas or because they are controlled by different transcription factors. And also, as a populations of astrocytes are actually activation states of astrocytes that are induced by stimuli associated with disease, infection, trauma. Both of these different types of astrocyte populations or subpopulations, which obviously are driven by different mechanisms, I'm going to refer to them as subsets because what I'm doing uh, uh, while doing so is actually highlighting one of the most important limitations of the field nowadays, which is we really don't understand for many of these subsets, whether they are developmentally defined or whether they are actually induced in the context of inflammation or pathology in response to very specific stimuli. The goal or my goal with my presentation today is to uh, discuss these subsets and in particular, try to focus on what controls the regulation in order to identify what could be potential targets for therapeutic intervention. So without further ado, let's go and let's start discussing these different subsets. And the first one I want to bring to your attention is actually a subset of astrocytes that is controlled by the transcription factor MAFG, and which we believe plays a role in promoting CNS pathology. So how is it that we identify it? So we performed a single uh, cell and single, single nuclei analysis of astrocytes in, um, um, in EIE models of MS and also in MS patients. And indeed, we integrated our data with other data sets that were available out there. And that allowed us to identify a population of astrocytes, which we define here as cluster one, which is expanded both in MS and, and, and EI. What is interesting about this astrocyte population is that, for example, if we focus in MS tissue, we can detect it significantly expanded in the cerebellum and the cortex. So with that uh, observation, we decided to move on and try to understand how is that this population is uh, regulated, what, is, what are the different roles of this population in pathology, and, 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 and what could be done in order to understand the cell-cell interactions that control it. First thing we did was actually to dig into the um, transcriptional signature associated to this um, uh, astrocyte subset. Uh, 
And the first thing we noticed was a significant perturbation of, uh, of metabolism. And indeed, that uh, was associated with specific perturbation of mitochondrial metabolism. And that actually tied up with, first of all, a very important study by Pellerin and Magistretti, who uh, showed um, a few years back that actually astrocytes are an important uh, a, a source uh, of, or a, an important uh, source of metabolites for neurons to function. In particular, astrocytes provide lactate for neurons to function. And indeed, uh, Chun Chai Chao in the lab uh, recently showed that in the context of inflammation, astrocytes undergo significant um, metabolic remodeling, and that results in a decreased ability of astrocytes to support the metabolic needs of neurons. The second observation we made while going through this data set was a significant deregulation of the unfolded protein response, in particular, a significant deregulation of XBP1 driven signaling. And, and that's interesting because Mike Wheeler had characterized the role of XBP1 in astrocytes and had shown that that's important in the regulation and in driving several astrocyte activities that are thought to contribute to the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. And what is even more interesting, after Mike published uh, his uh, results, uh, it was published that this very same mechanism might contribute to the pathogenic activity of astrocytes in additional neurodegenerative diseases, such as, for example, uh, neurodegeneration induced by a prion disease. So far, so good. So then the question is what regulates, what's really at the core of this regulation of the regulation of these astrocyte subject? Our transcriptional analysis identified as a candidate the transcription factor MAFG. As you know, MAF family of transcription factors is associated with the control of myeloid cells. CMAF is also involved in the regulation of certain uh, T cell functions. So we thought it would be interesting to characterize uh, what was the role of MAFG in the control of these specific astrocyte subjects. In order to do so, the first experiment we did was actually to um, um, inactivate via CRISPR, in, via CRISPR MAFG expression specifically in astrocytes. And as you can see here, when we do so, we detect a significant uh, decrease in EIE development, suggesting that indeed MAFG drives the differentiation of this specific astrocyte subset. And indeed, in a series of in vitro studies and additional in vivo studies, we were able to prove so. Now, when you look at the mechanisms by which MAFG could be controlling these specific astrocyte subset, it is known that MAFG is important in the control of the epigenetic status of astrocytes. And indeed, we were able to see that MAFG controls the activity or the, and the differentiation of these pathogenic astrocyte subset by controlling their methylation status. The last point we wanted to address is how does MAFG really control methylation and gene expression? And the reason we wanted to address that is because MAFG, as I mentioned, a small member of the MAF family of transcription factor, factors is known not to work alone. It actually has to cooperate with other factors in order to control gene expression. And in particular, there are three factors that have been shown to play important interactions in MAFG uh, activity. And those are MAF2A, BAH1, and BAH2. So to identify which one of these factors was relevant for the control of this specific astrocyte subset, we basically CRISPR inactivated each one of them. As you can see here, and we did that specifically in astrocytes, as you can see here, if we inactivate BAC1 or BAC2, there's really no uh, significant effect on the development of EIE. However, if we, when we inactivated MAT2A, we detected a phenotype which closely resembles the phenotype we obtained when we inactivate MAFG. These and additional um, studies in vitro and in vivo led us to conclude that MAFG and MAT2A cooperate in order to control the differentiation of these pathogenic astrocyte subsets. The last observation 
we made or we want, I want to share with you about this specific astrocyte subset is the fact that we detected significant signaling associated with GMCSF. As you know, GMCSF is a cytokine that has been shown to be produced by T cells uh, that cause uh, CNS pathology, multiple sclerosis and NIAE, and that was demonstrated by the laboratory of Buka Becker, by the laboratory of Rostami, and then uh, the laboratory of BJ Kushu also discussed and showed how GMC, GMCSF production is associated to pathogenic TH17 cells. The point is that usually GMCSF is thought, or is con is, is, is thought to act on myeloid cells. At the time of these studies, there were no reports about GMCSF acting on astrocytes in order to control CNS pathology. So we thought that would be an interesting question to address. And in order to do so, uh, we collaborated with Burkhard Becker and we basically generated mice in which GMCSF signaling is actually impaired specifically in astrocytes. And as you can see here, when we do that, we detect a significant amelioration of EIE, suggesting that in these, Indeed, GMCSF signaling promotes the differentiation of these uh, MAFG positive astrocytes. And indeed, we were able to demonstrate that in in vitro studies. Uh, the last question we wanted to address, and that has to do with the fact of the source of GMCSF in the context of the inflamed CNS, right? And as I mentioned, T cells, and indeed, CNS. Uh, T cells that promote CNS pathology in the context of EIE and in the context of MS are known to be uh, sources of GMCSF. So basically, we perform in situ transcriptomic studies where we try to uh, investigate the location of MAT, uh, MAFG, MAT2A positive astrocytes, and GMCSF producing T cells. Uh, to cut a long story short, we showed, we were able to detect a significant association between these MAFG driven astrocytes and T cells that produce GMCSF, suggesting that indeed in the context of CNS pathology, GMCSF produced by T cells drives the differentiation of these um, pathogenic or disease promoting uh, astrocyte subsets. So to summarize what I showed you so far, I described uh, we describe the population of MAFG positive astrocytes, which have a decreased ability to support the metabolic needs of neurons. So this is a classic example of how uh, astrocytes or some homeostatic functions of astrocytes are, um, are impaired in the context of CNS inflammation. This astrocyte subset seems to show or bears an uh, deregulated uh, uh, XBP driven uh, and for the protein response. And what is interesting is that this astrocyte subset, and I will get back to that, seems to be controlled by close interactions with T cells mediated via the cytokine GMCSF. And that is, that's a point I'm going to get back, go back to soon. So this is the first example I wanted to share with you. This serves as an example of a population of astrocytes, which seems to be promoting CNS pathology. Now, at the end of the spectrum, what I want to share with you now is actually a subset of astrocytes which we recently identified and which seems to have an anti-inflammatory role. And this is a subset of astrocytes characterized by the expression of the molecule trait. The way we uh, identify this astrocyte subset is very similar to what I showed you before. We were performing unbiased investigations uh, trying to identify astrocyte subsets, in this case, using uh, a, a proteomic approach where we were screening astrocytes in the context of EIE with about 250 antibodies. And it caught, to our, atten it caught our attention that uh, we detected a population of astrocytes that was expressing this specific molecule called TRAIL. For those of you that have worked on T-cell immunology, TRAIL is a non-inducer inducer of T-cell apoptosis. So based on our findings on T cell astrocyte crosstalk, we thought that would be an interesting molecule to investigate and an interesting astrocyte uh, population to investigate. So the first experiment we did was basically to inactivate trail expression specifically in astrocytes via CRISPR. And as you can see here, when we do so, we detect a significant worsening of EIE. 
And, and that uh, worsening of EIE goes uh, hand in hand with a decrease in T cell apoptosis in the CNS. So that and additional experiments uh, that we performed in vivo and in vitro led us to conclude that trail expression in the surface of astrocytes triggers T cell apoptosis and it does so via the interaction with this uh, receptor called DR5 as a way of limiting CNS inflammation. And one important point that I want to bring up is the fact that these trail positive astrocytes seem to be located just underneath the meninges as a way of really controlling, right, the borders of the CNS. So the next question we wanted to address then was, how is it that this astrocyte subset is populated, is regulated? And our studies actually identified interferon gamma signaling as a candidate regulator of this astrocyte subset, which was extremely interesting because interferon gamma has been known for years, as you can see here, almost for 24, 25 years, uh, to regulate and to be a negative regulator of uh, EIE. So we thought that would be interesting. So the first experiment we did was actually to activate astrocytes in vitro with interferon gamma. And as you see here, when we do so, when we activate astrocytes with interferon gamma, we induce a significant upregulation of trail expression. And indeed, those astrocytes that have been treated with interferon gamma now gain the activity, the ability to induce T cell apoptosis. One important point and one interesting observation is that if we induce those astrocytes with interferon gamma and then we treat them with GMCSF, which a few slides ago I told you induces a, a pathogenic subset of astrocytes, then we suppress the expression of trail and we suppress this anti inflammatory activity of astrocytes. So going back to that slide I showed earlier, talking about astrocyte subsets and activation states, we believe that this data suggests that these trail positive astrocytes, right, are highly plastic and might uh, represent an, an, an anti-inflammatory activation status of astrocytes that is highly reversible uh, when needed. Now, to investigate whether interferon gamma also controls uh, trail expression in astrocytes in vivo, we uh, CRISPR out the interferon gamma receptor or STAT1, which as you know, comes just underneath. And as you can see here, when we do so, we detect a significant worsening of EIE, which actually resembles the worsening we detected when we inactivated trail expression in astrocytes. Indeed, when we inactivate interferon gamma signaling in astrocytes, we detect a significant decrease in trail expression and that goes along with a significant decrease in T cell apoptosis. So that suggests that actually interferon gamma signaling in astrocytes is what drives trail expression in, in them and hence what drives this trail driven anti inflammatory program. So the next question we wanted to address is since these astrocytes are detected even in naive mice, right? What is the source of interferon gamma in these naive mice? And while trying to address that question, uh, we went back to our observation that these astrocytes are really located just underneath the meninges. And we thought, we postulated that probably immune cells circulating through the meninges might be a source of interferon gamma. Indeed, a few years back, Yoni Kibnis had shown that interferon gamma produced by T cells circulating through the meninges can actually affect the activity of uh, neurons. So we thought that would be interesting. So the first thing we did was actually to use interferon gamma reporter mice and investigate and just quantify the different sources of interferon gamma in the meninges of naive mice. And as you can see here, the main source of interferon gamma in those mice were NK cells. Indeed. If we use uh, an NK cell depleting antibody, uh, we can decrease the number of NK cells in the meninges, and that goes along with a significant decrease in the number of trail expressing astrocytes. Conversely, if we now take NK cells producing or not interferon gamma, separated based on the expression of the interferon gamma reporter, and we co incubate them with astrocytes interferon gamma producing NK cells can actually induce trail expression in astrocytes. And when they do so, 
this astrocyte gained the ability to induce T cell apoptosis. These and additional experiments led us to conclude that uh, NK cells are one of the physiological sources of interferon gamma that actually induces this anti-inflammatory program in astrocytes. The last question we wanted to address was actually how is it that interferon gamma is regulated in, the, uh, in these NK cells that circulate through the meninges. And the reason or, or something that really um, uh, uh, kind of guided us in our studies were some uh, publications that reported that interferon gamma expression is actually induced in NK cells in the gut in response to commensal flora signals. So we thought, and, and we thought actually that would be very exciting, that potentially this would suggest that the commensal flora by regulating interferon gamma production in NK cells could potentially control uh, this anti-inflammatory uh, program in astrocytes, providing a new insight into this gut-brain axis that seems to control inflammation and CNS pathology. So in order to address that question, the first experiment we did was a very simple one. We just took chain-free mice and we quantified NK cells in the meninges. And we made two observations. First of all, the total number of NK cells circulating through the meninges is not affected by the presence or not of commensal flora. However, what was important is that uh, the frequency of NK cells that circulate through the meninge and produce interferon gamma was strongly dependent on the gut flora. Indeed, in gem-free mice, we detected a significant decrease in interferon gamma producing NK cells circulating through the meninges. More importantly, that decrease in the production of um, interferon gamma by NK cells circulating through the meninges actually was reflected as a decrease in the expression of trail in, 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 in CNS astrocytes. So that actually suggested something very interesting that potentially NK cells are educated by the commensal flora to produce interferon gamma. And as they circulate through the body, some of those go to the meninges and then can induce this anti-inflammatory program in astrocytes. In order to address or to investigate a little bit further that hypothesis, we actually use a caidi mice in which we can induce the expression of, the, of a red reporter upon, upon, uh, upon uh, UV uh, exposure to a laser. So we use those mice we irradiated them specifically in the gut. And then 24 hours later, we tried to detect whether we could detect cells that have been in the gut and now are circulating to the meninges. And the answer is yes, we can detect those NK cells. Interestingly, those NK cells circulate to the meninges but do not infiltrate the CNS parenchyma. So there's, what this suggests is that actually NK cells are stopping or they're being exposed to signals from the commensal flora in the gut, and then they circulate through the body and some of those cells circulate through the meninges. Now we combine this system with antibiotic treatment. And what we could see is that if those cells, uh, if, if, if they, those cells that were at the, at the gut are not exposed to signals provided by the commensal flora, then their ability to produce interferon gamma is significantly suppressed suggesting that the commensal flora acts actually on NK cells via signals which we still do not really uh, completely understand, uh, but it acts on the NK cells in order to induce interferon gamma production. And those cells circulate through the body. Some of them circulate through the meninges. And when they do so, they induce this anti-inflammatory transcriptional program in astrocytes. So we leave this in, this is interesting because this adds more complexity, right, to the gut-brain axis. A few years back, Fadrod Hammer in the lab had described that uh, microbial metabolites, right, that activate the transcription factor AHR, and Sue was referring to that earlier on. Actually, some of them, because of their uh, chemical properties, can reach the CNS and control the activity of astrocytes, microglia, and the crosstalk. Then it was also shown, for example, Marco Prince has shown that uh, short-chain fatty acids could potentially act on uh, by regulating 
uh, microglial responses. However, these are kind of mechanisms that are mediated by metabolites. What our data suggests is that immune cells that are educated by the gut flora can actually also be uh, carry signals to the CNS in order to control uh, the responses of CNS resident cells such as astrocytes. And that's important because that allowed us to allows us to start thinking about uh, probiotics that we can actually engineer in order to produce specific metabolites or to activate specific pathways. And we are recent, recently published on, on one type of such of those probiotics and we're working on additional ones that we believe could be used to control and to target this gut brain axis. Now, just to summarize, this was the second example I wanted to share with you. This is an example of a pro-inflammatory, of an anti-inflammatory astrocyte subset that seems to see that they at the borders of the brain and induces T cell apoptosis. And what is exciting about it is that again, going back to what I showed you before, the, in this case, this astrocyte subset is also induced by cell cell crosstalk. It's also induced by the communication between NK cells and astrocytes, in this case, via interferon gamma. So if we step back, right? What this really is, 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 is highlighting is important of cell-cell interactions. It's going back to those drawings by Ramon y Cajal, where he was showing that astrocytes are interacting with so many other cell types. So I talked earlier today about astrocytes talking with uh, T cells and NK cells. We and others have worked on the communication of astrocytes with neurons and oligos. This is some of our work on this area. And we and others have also talked and studied the role of microglia and astrocytes in cross-talking and, 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 and how these interactions can really contribute to CNS pathology. The problem is many of these interactions, right, have been identified because we've been very focused on one specific pathway. The challenge is how can we understand how these cells talk? How can we do that in a, in a talk to each other? How can we do it in an unbiased manner, right? And how can we do that in vivo? Because if we do it in vitro, uh, we are at risk of picking up artifacts. So in order to address that question, we developed a new technique, which we call RabbitSeq, which basically uses the rabies virus as a way, as a conduit to uh, uh, deposit, to transfer uh, a barcode, a genetically encoded barcode to interacting cells. So then we can basically analyze the CNS by single cell RNA-seq quantify the expression of the barcode and by doing so identify or detect cell cell interactions that were occurring in vivo. So the first uh, time when we applied this technique was actually in the context of um, uh, EIE. And the first caveat, the first piece of data, right, you get is literally your classic UMAP or Disney plot. I mean, you've seen hundreds of them by now basically where each one of the dots represent uh, a single cell and for each cell you have transcriptional data. The difference or what RabbitSeq brings into the system is the fact that now for each one of those dots, you have a barcode that allows you to say or to determine which cells were interacting uh, with each other. And hence you can turn these UMAP plots and you can term and turn them into something like this these interaction maps, which seem very complex, but where at the very end of the day, at the very root of them, you have single cell data, which has been organized in order to know which cell was interacting with which cell in vivo. And that's important because then you can focus on these cell interactions of interest and try to identify, first of all, obviously, who was interacting with whom and how those interactions were affected in the context of inflammation. But then you can actually go deeper and you can try to identify interaction mechanisms uh, associated to your cells of interest and what could be the potential um, biological consequences of those interactions. So we, with that in mind, the first thing we wanted to do was just to validate our findings. And we were happy to see that we could recapitulate microglia astrocyte interactions mediated via BGF signaling that Feitrot Hammer had described in the lab earlier on. And we were also able to recapitulate uh, interactions between astrocytes and peripheral immune cells recruited to the CNS. 
such as those mediated uh, by IL-10 that were described by Lior Mayo and, um, and Jessica Kenison in the lab. So, so far, so good. So then this seems to be working. So what can we learn about the system? Um, we decided to do was to really focus on those astrocytes that show the highest pro-inflammatory response. Remember, this is based on single cell sequencing, so we can really be very picky and we can go and identify which specific population we want to investigate. And once we identify those astrocyte subsets, you know, that astrocyte subset, we look, we look back and we wanted to identify what are the microglia that interact with them and how are they regulated. So to our surprise, when we performed that experiment, the first thing we noticed was that many of the interactions we were detecting were mediated by axon guidance pathways. And to cut it short, these are uh, signaling pathways that are known to be important during development, that, but that have not been described to mediate microglia astrocyte interactions in the context of pathology. Even more, when we went on, we, we went down, the first specific pathway we identified within this category is a pathway mediated by the F receptor and its ligand ephrine. The F receptor, is actually a tyrosin kinase receptor, and that will become important, meaning that here in the intracellular domain, you have a tyrosin kinase that is central for a signal transaction. In particular, we identify FB3 as a candidate receptor expressed by astrocyte. And FB3 is known to interact with membrane-bound ligands, in particular with ephrine B3, which also has an intracellular domain that can trigger signal transaction. So this, from the beginning, was a very exciting candidate interaction because it can mediate bidirectional signaling between astrocytes and microglia. And then in terms of genetics, there were some interesting reports that associated these pathways with some uh, neurodegenerative and uh, neurotrauma conditions. So with that in mind, we decided to investigate this pathway uh, functionally. And the first experiment we did was actually to analyze MS tissue. And as you can see here, we detected a significant upregulation of the FP3 receptor in microglia uh, in astrocytes and a significant upregulation of ephraim B3, its ligand in microglia in MS lesions. And actually we could validate that when we analyzed uh, single cell uh, data. If we actually now perturb, perturb these pathways functionally in vivo, we detect a significant amelioration of EIE if we inactivate basically the expression of FB3 in astrocytes or ephraim B3 in microglia, and indeed that goes along with a significant decrease in the transcriptional pro-inflammatory response of astrocytes. If we actually go down and try to understand how is it that this signaling pathway controls uh, astrocyte pro-inflammatory responses, uh, actually what we found is that every FP3 signaling basically controls mTOR activity. And by doing so, it controls mitochondrial function and it actually can trigger mitochondrial dysregulation and the production of reactive oxygen species that promote inflammation and new degeneration. And indeed, Atsushi Kadowaki in the lab has worked out in detail how uh, this happens. Then, as I mentioned, this is a very interesting pathway because it can trigger signaling both in astrocytes and microglia, right? Because these are interactions mediated by membrane-bound proteins and ephraim B3 microglia can also trigger signaling. To cut a long story short, we show that this interaction actually triggers or boosts NF-kappa-B signaling in microglia. And you can see this, for example, in, in, in the context of uh, EIE brains. But we haven't worked out yet the molecular mechanisms that mediate really that uh, signaling from Ephraim B3 into NF kappa B. And the last question we wanted to address had to do with the fact that, as I mentioned, this is first of all a pathway that seems to be boosting the pro inflammatory disease promoting activities of both astrocytes and microglia. That obviously makes it an interesting candidate for therapeutic intervention. An additional point is that, as I mentioned earlier, FP3 is a tyrosine kinase receptor. So one could potentially envision 
developing small molecules as a way of suppressing or interfering with this pro-inflammatory pathway. In order to do so, basically we screen several libraries and we end up identifying a molecule which we call A38, A38 which is CNS permeable and has the ability to suppress the kinase activity of Ephraim B3. If we actually test this molecule in multiple models, this is the EIE uh, B6 model, we can get a significant suppression of astrocyte and microglia pro-inflammatory activities, and obviously a significant amelioration of disease course. So to summarize, we identify one pathway, right? That seems to be activated in MS lesions and seems to be driving disease pathology by boosting astrocyte pro-inflammatory, astrocyte microglia pro-inflammatory interactions. If we go down our list, the second pathway that we identify, it involves semaphorin interactions. And to cut a long story short, we found a similar interaction to the one I just described, mediated by semaphorin 4D expressed in microglia and plexin B2 and plexin B1 expressed in astrocytes. The interesting thing, thing though, is that this interaction seems to involve or be located, associated not only to MS lesions, but also to normally appear in white matter. And indeed, if we analyze single cell data sets, seems to be involving different cell populations. So this is a population, this is an interaction that seems to be involved different cell subsets than the ones mediated by or activated by Ephrin and FB3. So to summarize what I show you today, then we, this last part of my talk, I told you about this new technique which we developed, which we call RabbitSeq. We initially developed to work in mice, but now we've been able to apply to the study of uh, human tissue and even uh, doing some work on, on, on living non-human pri primates. And just to give you an example of how we have used it for human tissue, one of the areas of interest in the lab is glioblastoma, as many of you might know. This is a very aggressive cancer with a very bad prognosis and which is known to be very immunosuppressive. And that strong immunosuppressive component is thought to be driven by the fact that the tumor uh, establishes interactions with astrocytes, microglia, recruited monocytes in the tumor microenvironment that really drive multiple anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive responses. So we thought this would be a perfect tool, a perfect problem to be investigated with RabbitSeq because in, many, in patients, many times you can obtain primary tissue that is removed, right? Patient tissue that is removed uh, as part of uh, the therapy of glioblastoma. So we established a way of running RabbitSeq in, 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 in clinical samples and we used it to identify what we believe are candidate interactions between GBM and astrocytes and GBM cells, glioblastoma cells and astrocytes or, or, or additional interactions driving the tumor microenvironment. And as we speak, we are uh, gearing up to test those interactions in CRISPR uh, studies in vivo with the idea that identifying those interactions and identifying the mechanisms that drive those interactions might provide novel targets for therapeutic intervention. The last point I want to make is that we identify these interactions mediated by astrocytes and microglia that are seem to be mediated by, surf, by surface-bound proteins. And that actually suggests, as shown here in a electron microscopy we generated in collaboration with Marco Prince, that astrocytes and microglia establish interactions much closer than what we used to think. We used to think of astrocytes and microglia crosstalk can be as soluble factors. Our data suggests that there's very uh, um, close interactions established by these cells and probably different types of proteins mediating these interactions. And this is an area of active research. And the last point uh, I want to make is that we use this technique RabbitSeq as a way of really identifying some of those pathways, right, that mediate astrocyte microglium interactions that promote CNS pathology. And, and one of those pathway, F, pathways, Ephraim B3, FB3, we were able to identify one specific molecule that we think can be used to block those pro-inflammatory interactions and which we are actively working on optimizing to improve it and to make it a molecule that could potentially be used uh, for human treatment.
And with that, I'm going to finish. Basically, I want you to leave, I want to leave you with the idea that if you look into the CNS, right? And if you look into CNS pathology and CNS inflammation, obviously there's lots to be learned about uh, the role of T cells and adaptive immune cells, but in the CNS, as in many other tissues, CNS resident cells play a central role. We talked today about the role of astrocytes, the most abundant uh, glial cell of the CNS. And we talk in particular about different astrocyte subsets, how they can promote or limit inflammation and how many of those functions and phenotypes are controlled by cell-cell interactions. And with that, I'm going to finish. I just want to acknowledge the work of all of those that led these studies, Mike Wheeler, Cristina Gutierrez Vasquez, Ian Clark, and Liliana San Marco. And with that, I invite you all to tweet your questions. Here is the Twitter account from the lab. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Fran. That was just really insightful. The depth at which you go from, you know, just pure basic biology and fundamental new insights to mechanism is always just a, um, a, a, a treat. Um, I'm going to share the slide that will let our panelists now see how to communicate with you. So we'd love you to first of all, spread the word and please tell your friends and your colleagues about Global Immuno Talks and send them the links to the videos. We now have uh, many talks on, on YouTube that are just a, a great library of talks. And so for you to find Fran and to ask some great questions, please go to uh, search in the account in Twitter under Global Immuno Talks. Find the tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Francisco Quintana here, and then go ahead and tweet your uh, question and, and hashtag global immuno. Um, and he, you can also reach him at, at the, his Twitter link right there is at Quintana Lab HMS. So please um, feel free to reach out and thank you again, Fran. Thank you all. Thanks for having me. <laughs>